Good? Okay. Um, wow, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to be here and to get a chance to talk, uh, talk about stories. Uh, for those of you who aren't so familiar with what I do, a lot of what I do is uh, working in scattering amplitudes, and, and scattering amplitudes is a field that's grown tremendously over the past, uh, over the past couple decades. Um, we rely, most of our strength relies on our strong connection to collider experiment, uh, ex collider experiment phenomenology, but um, uh, we've been reaching out and retouching all sorts of areas, and a lot of what I've been playing with has been uh, in this realm, between formal relativistic quantum field theory and string theory and scattering amplitudes, but to the goal of learning and understanding structure that we really hope uh, will come, comes out and, and, and seems to offer things to say about uh, all these fields. Okay, so stories. So physicists are great at telling stories, we're spectacular at telling classical stories, and we're getting uh, better every day at telling relativistic quantum stories, although I think it's clear that we're not necessarily nailed down on all the nouns and verbs, players and actions involved with these stories. Uh, we're definitely getting better at it. I think the point, I made a slide with just one word on it for stories, is that physics isn't just a black box. We're not satisfied with something where we just stick in initial conditions and then outcome predictions without any story behind it because it's stories that allow us to generalize, to make analogies, to go from one situation to another situation to really build, I think, what we understand as insight. Um, and so, uh, how do we traditionally tell our stories are relativistic? quantum story as well. Actions are a great way, a uh, great way to set up the story. And, and we learn the story by, perturbatively at least, with Feynman rules. Um, of course, there are uncountably infinite ways of adding zero to all of your predictions by modifying your action in various ways, changing gauges, adding auxiliary fields that don't do anything. Um, and all of these affect the story you're telling without necessarily affecting the predictions. Um, okay, and so, so Feynman rules is sort of the textbook approach to extracting uh, stories from actions. Um, and, and one of the things that's traditionally been a, a, a fairly high priority is, is compact actions. We find them aesthetically very pleasing, even if uh, the way they'll take us through predictions can sometimes be somewhat laborious and, uh, and, and complicated. Um, an example here is a, a beautiful action. This gives us all of uh, general relativity through equations of motion. Um, so who can complain about such a spectacular action? But when you start to try to extract the term of predictions, line one, you run into trouble. You run into uh, a headache that even just the, the three graviton interact, whether you're trying to do some five loop super complicated super gravity calculation, or even just try to get some sort of nonlinear effect um, in, in, in some classical perturbative solution. Uh, you have to start dealing with gravitons speaking to each other if you want to deviate from, from Newton's gravity, right? And uh, in line one, uh, that in generic gauges, you're dealing, you're dealing with a mess, you're dealing with a real headache. Um, by the time you start talking really higher order corrections, like three loops, um, you'd naively be looking at something that's got 10 to the 20 terms in it. But, in the, but we know when you actually talk about something physical, at the end you get remarkably compact expressions. When you go on shell, you get remarkably compact expressions. Just an example, the maximum supersymmetric supergravity theory, after you add up all the other particles that are running around this loop, all 250, five other states besides one holicity gluon, uh, gravitons, um, then you find a remarkable uh, simplicity at the end. And so, so there's some truths obscured by actions, and these are truths that you can use to build your predictions. Um, one is that if you're just worried about running out of space, if you want to be dealing with compact expressions, you can calculate with physical onshell quantities where you, you make all your uh, all, all, all the things you're talking about actually real. 
Um, uh, by, by, yeah, and so, uh, and, and a consequence of, of starting to look for only talking about physical on-cell quantities to build up your quantum predictions is that you realize you can recycle classical tree-level quantities, and they contain all the information necessary to specify the integrand of, of your loop-level quantities. And this was, uh, I, I, bolded, I bolded David here, so this is an insight from uh, David, our, our very own David Kossauer from the 90s, and this has really revolutionized the field of higher loop calculations, the fact that you can actually access this using incredibly compact expressions. Um, <clears throat> and then for many of our favorite theories for um, massless gauging gravity theories, the physical on-shell three vertices contain all the information necessary to build all tree-level amplitudes. So once you have the physical three-point vertex, you can recurse to get all, all tr multiplicity tree-level amplitudes with all multiplicity tree-level amplitudes, then you can start going so uh, you can at least in principle start going to access all loop order information. Uh, and another consequence of having this easy way to um, verify whether or not you're talking about right things is the natural needs of construction. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But so if we're going to go back and look at that, that three vertex, but now we're going to put things on shelves, so we're actually talking about a three point amplitude, uh, we see a spectacular simplicity emerge and it's uh, it's easy to compare it to the physical three out of the one vertex which I have up here. So this is this is now the graviton where I put the external states on shell and we see a beautiful factorization and we see even right here at three points that the prediction in gravity is intimately related to the prediction in gauge theory. In fact it's exactly the same as the prediction in gauge theory except you strip off the color weight and replace with another copy of the kinematic weight. Um, so this color weight is just dressing, uh, dressing your graph with uh, FABC structure constants. Now, I've snuck in FABC structure constants, and for those of you guys who aren't intimately dancing with this uh, every day, there are only two properties you need to remember about your Lie algebra structure constants for the rest of the talk. One is that they satisfy an anti-symmetry and any of their indices, and that when you glue any together, you get your Kobe identities, and you can represent this graphically. Right? So the two, the two important things that we'll use for the rest of the talk about structure constants are anti-symmetry and Jacobi, both of them you can represent graphically. Okay, so now armed with our on-shell insight, we're ready to solve all of life's problems. Um, turns out there's additional complexity head and this additional complexity is complexity of insisting on local representations. Um, and just to illustrate this, I'll start with one loop, and these are just all the unique topologies. I didn't bother writing down all the permutations of how they have to be labeled. Um, and if at one loop, it doesn't look so bad. At two loops, it's growing a little bit, but when you look at three loops, you realize that you're actually on a factorial curve, worse than exponential. And I just want to emphasize this, that what we're dealing with perturbative calculation is we're going to either higher multiplicity or higher loop order. What we're really fighting is a factorial growth in complexity. And this is why for all our exponential growth and computational power, it takes new ideas to be able to push us to the next stage. Ideas that help start beating down this factorial complexity and hopefully, ideally, Perhaps some ideas that in some cases can let us uh, reduce this factorial complexity entirely. Just to emphasize what these different lines are, so, so this is, this, uh, this is a, obviously a log plot, so this is, this is polynomial scaling, as you might be worried about with um, classical n-body simulation. We don't even notice this, this is flat, even exponential, which are the number of uh, Planar graphs you might know, so some theories you might like to think about in terms of you know the infinite infinite color limits. You've only got planar graphs contributing. That's uh, only an exponential number of graphs, but even that's incredibly mild relative to what we have to deal with when we're talking about all the different graphs that contribute, which is really a factorial growth. Okay, and so this is this is 
this is what we're going after. Um, <clears throat> and just to make it very clear, what we're going after with is this theme of scattering predictions. It is the mapping of in states, free states at asymptotic, uh, past infinity to free states at asymptotic, <laughs> future infinity, and we're looking for the invariant predictions uh, that, that map between those for particular theories. Um, and we don't care about the story that goes on here when we're trying to tell what theory we're talking about. We just care that we are, in fact, making the correct mapping from in-states and out-states. So for the purpose of knowing that we're making a correct prediction, then, then we can treat it as a black box. So if we, if we make a prediction using one story, we can try rearranging the story to make our lives easier as long as we're landing on the same predictions. We're talking about the same theory, right? We're talking about the same theory, but just a different set of stories associated with it. Um, just to nail down, of course, we can talk about S matrices for quantum field theory, non relativistic quantum mechanics, string theory, even classical physics can give us some notion of, of, of the scattering mapping, this interaction mapping. Um, but using the techniques I just talked about, just even unitarity, what we'll find is we'll get the same prediction, but, but definitely very different stories. Um, and some of these stories, you'll see, can lead to, to a very interesting type of insight. So, uh, before I continue, let's just, let's just talk about what's necessary um, for I walk up to you and I say, hey, I just calculated five loops, maximum supersymmetric supergravity theory, here's the integrand. Right? How do you know I didn't just make it up? How do you verify that what I gave you is actually what I said it is? And there's a, a necessary condition, which if I hand you some integrand, <coughs> if you integrate it, you better get exactly the same thing that you would have with Feynman rules for that action. Right? This is this is Almost a tautology, but if you integrate the integrand I give you and you get something that something else, then you would have gotten the final rules, then I've given you a prediction for a different theory than I said I did. So so it's necessary is um, is that the integrands have to line up. Uh, I, I'd like to arrange my integrands in terms of graphs uh, specifically because of the verification of optatility. Um, and just the other just a, like a month ago. I ran into this somewhere on the street in uh, in Paris. I don't. If anybody knows what Graphland is, I'd love you to tell me. But anyway, from now on, we're going to be living in Graphland. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is necessary. I use some expression in terms of graphs. You integrate it, you better land on what you would have gotten with Feynman rules. Um, what's sufficient is if uh, if if we match on unitarity cuts. At the integrand, uh, which, which this this isn't necessary. We we could match only up to total derivatives, right? So we could have a deviation that integrates to zero. But as long as we match, uh, this is this is absolutely sufficient. So if we satisfy all unitarity cuts, then uh, then you know the theory I've uh, I'm saying I'm predicting is 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 the theory I've given you. So this is just a breaking down to a tree level of these multi-loop expressions completely on-shelf physical expressions where all the Feynman information is encoded in, in sums over products of trees. Uh, and so it makes it very easy to verify uh, complicated expressions I might have handed you in terms of graphs just going against simple products of trees. And it's spectacular. Like, well, so, of course, you could say there's a factorial number of cuts I could consider, and that would be true, but we're saved by something which is that cut span. So cuts involving higher order trees, if they're satisfied by local graphical expressions, then any expansion of the tree to, to um, higher point, to lower point vertices, or as any way of blowing up that tree and cutting it, is automatically going to be satisfied. So this means you can roll up your verification of unitarity cuts into an incredibly small number of high multiplicity trees, um, high multiplicity uh, cuts. And so, for example, for something like 
you know, four loops at four points, you know, there's a handful of cuts that you really need to check. And having satisfied those, then, um, then you know you'll satisfy all the other cuts that comprise um, those high, comprise those high, uh, high vertex cuts. And so this, this leads to very easy verification. As I said earlier, when you have an easy verification, this leads to uh, natural means of construction. Um, and as anybody who's ever played the parlor game uh, 20 questions knows that even though you have an infinite number of things to choose from, well-chosen question, well-chosen prose, you can narrow yourself down to an answer. Sometimes it's just a very small number of moves. Um, and there's a similar, similar philosophy here that, uh, that if, if, if the, the name of the game, if it is sufficient to satisfy all cuts, then build something that satisfies all cuts by construction starting at maximal cuts, consider all the cubic graphs, cut all the legs, and assign any of those data to the, to the graphical elements associated with those cubic graphs. Um, and then what you've made sure is that whatever your errors are in your representation, they're only associated with things that vanished on these higher cuts. They're only associated with inverse propagators. And so then you can start rolling up your cuts, considering that uh, everybody, all, the, all your trees cubic except for one portic. So taking that one propagator off shell, see if there are any missing information associated with that data, associate that to the graphs, and so on and so forth, rolling up the data until you have a final answer that satisfies all the cuts. Um, and, uh, and then you're done. And uh, what you land on with stuff like this, however, uh, are things that would take a very peculiar set of, um, of auxiliary fields and generalized gauge choices to land on directly from Feynman. Um, <clears throat> for example, so this is uh, the original, so, so what I've done here is I'm putting three loops, so, so two to two scattering in maximum symmetric gauge theory, maximum symmetric gravity theory, I'm putting it on the same page because I'm able to associate both predictions with just nine graphs. Um, and, and for the gauge theory, I'm just writing the kinematic weight of the numerator. I'm not writing the color factors. Of course, there are color weights dress, that you get from dressing everybody with FADCs. Um, and for the gravity, of course, there's no color, it's just kinematics. And I haven't written down the propagators. The propagator structure you can just read off from these scalar like diagrams. It's just the way the massless information uh, propagate, propagates. Um, <coughs> But, so, so I, I have no doubt that you could cook up the right type of auxiliary fields such that your Feynman rules result only in cubic graphs uh, for both theories. But as you know, natural Feynman rules, right, from, from both these theories, this guy would have um, cubic and, uh, so three point and four point interactions because it's yang -Bills. And gravity would have three point and four point and five point and six point and seven point interactions because it's gravity. Right? So it, goes, it has an infinite number of contact terms. But you can assign this. You can assign this data to cubic graphs, um, and uh, and we did. And so this is just, if you like, a random representation or, or a random representation that satisfies all cuts. But even in this random representation, there's some structure that you can observe. <coughs> and it's a structure that, that actually led to a, a very different way of, of thinking about these theories for, for, for many of us. Uh, so one thing I'd like you to notice is that in the gauge theory on the left, um, all, these, all these three graphs come with the same uh, kinematic weight. And the gravity theory on the right has just the gauge theory's kinematic weight squared. All three of these guys have the same kinematic weight for the gauge theory. The gravity theory has the kinematic weight squared. <coughs> Excuse me. This doesn't echo. I mean, so this doesn't persist for these last two guys, but you'll see that there are echoes of this structure. And then there's some other sort of uh, garbage caught in. 
but in any case, it satisfies the cost. Um, it turns out, behind, behind these guys all being the same, behind these guys all being the same, was a principle that we didn't even realize, which is that you could tell a story that, um, that intimately relates uh, all the graphs of the gauge theory. And, uh, and when you do so, you only need the information associated with this graph, and then algebraic relations propagate the kinematic relates uh, to everybody else. So all these guys, A through D, H and I, J and L, they're all expressed as algebraic functions uh, of, of, uh, of this dressing. And when you've written it in this form, then, uh, then you get the gravity theory for free. Then, so I'm able to put both the gauge theory and the gravity theory in the same column. The gravity theory just has a kinematic weight that's a square of this one. And so, so this lesson that we learned is that, uh, is that for many of our favorite theories, um, color and kinematics dance together. So, so this is just another example of uh, the Jacobi identity that I, I mentioned before that that color weights, what they do for a living is they satisfy anti-symmetry and they satisfy Jacobi, but it turns out for these series you can find representations where the kinematic weights satisfy the same algebraic relations as the color weights. And when you do, you've arranged it in a form that you can pry off either the color weights or the kinematic weights and replace with some other information that satisfies the same identities. And then you talk about predictions in what would otherwise seem to be completely disparate theories like gauge theory gravity. So, um, just, just to put some equations on the board, so tree-level predictions in gauge theory can write in terms of color weights, kinematic weights, and some sort of propagator structure. Uh, and the point is that both these guys, these color weights and these kinematic weights, can always be found in a representation. So first of all, I can always express in terms of cubic graphs, and I can uh, always find kinematic weights that satisfy the same algebraic properties as the color weights. Um, <clears throat> I've tried to keep this uh, presentation free of, of too many formula, but I think if I was seeing for this for the first time, I'd like to at least see like an example, a simple four-point example. So this is a, a tree-level example that doesn't hurt the eyes. This is a nonlinear sigma model, which is one of these classes of theories. It turns out that you can arrange, uh, so you can call it flavor kinematics, or color kinematic, you can arrange the kinematic weights to be the same structure as, as, uh, as the, uh, the flavor weight. Um, so this is, this is a leading piece group uh, contribution to the Carlo Grande to be familiar to many of you. Um, and I'm telling you that even though, of course, this only has uh, even point interactions, so 4.6 point, only has even point interactions, I can still write it in terms of cubic graphs, and here's an explicit uh, explicit form where I'm going to express uh, I'm express the kinematic weight associated with this graph uh, uh, such that such that it satisfies both anti-symmetry and Jacobi the same way that color weight does. And so just to make things very definite, I chose a particular color weight just so you guys could see an expression at the end that satisfies anti-symmetry and Jacobi for color, uh, and then this expression satisfies anti-symmetry and Jacobi for kinematics and reproduces the four-point scattering amplitude of, uh, of the theory between the two to two pion scatterings here. Um, you'll notice, okay, so I introduced a notation, this symmetric uh, AB for K is just KA plus KB, and this uh, bracket is an anti-symmetric KA minus KB, um, what I'd like you to notice right away, though, is that, uh, that, so this is K1 plus K2 squared, and this is K3 plus K4 squared, which is identical, and which is just this propagator. So what's going on is the reason that I'm able to express something that only has four point final rules from your favorite, perhaps, representation in terms of cubic graphs is because this kinematic weight right here is just eating up the propagator, right? So it's just collapsing the propagator. So it's local, right? So the numerator of the denominator cancels this part. But this part is very important for satisfying uh, the algebraic properties. I have a scientist to cubic graphs that have to satisfy properties. Um, it's pretty easy to see uh, that this satisfies that 
this guy satisfies anti, uh, anti-symmetry, so if I swap one in two, then I'm just exchanging these two guys, and I pick up a minus sign. If I swap one in two, I'm not doing anything here, but I pick up a minus sign over here. And similarly, I've made uh, any of the flips or any of the automorphic symmetry signs manifest. Um, checking that things uh, manifest Jacobi takes a little bit more work, but, but not much. Um, I think, well, how, how am I for time? Where am I? Who's, who's, who's monitoring my time? I did it. Okay. So uh, let me take you through this example because I think, I think it's, it's good uh, because it's very simple and it's very easy. So Jacobi, um, Jacobi is satisfied if the kinematic weight associated with this NS graph is kinematic weight associated with NU and NT, and we're going to treat this as a, as a function, right? So, so, um, so this is uh, this is satisfied if NS minus NU minus NT is zero. So this is NS. Now to get from NS to uh, and you, I just have to swap S and U to get from N S to NT, I have to swap S and T. Um, and after a laborious calculation, then we can convince ourselves that, uh, that everything does in fact cancel. Right, so, so this is just, the, the reason I, I stepped through it is because I think it's, it's, it's good to see just how by playing with inner products of of kinematics, and here, I'm, of course, this, this is all dimension independent, right? So it's, it's just, you know, it's just uh, Lorentz invariance. Um, I can manifest the same algebraic structure as, uh, as uh, in, in kinematics as, as I can with color weights. Um, and so, uh, and so, as I said, when you've written things in this form, we've written like where everything's obeying the same algebra, then it is like Legos. You can sort of pull off pieces and replace with other pieces. If I, t- I might talk about Yang Mills and I pull off the color weight and I have another Yang Mills weight, then I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about gravity. If it's super Yang Mills, I'm talking about super gravity. Uh, if instead I pulled off a color weight and instead replaced it with the Jacobi satisfying uh, numerators of the nonlinear sigma model, then I'd be talking about born infeld or super symmetric. Invariance. There's all sorts of this whole web of theories going on. Um, but what it, again, what initially attracted us is this relationship between gauge and gravity. So if you see a twinkle in Albert's eye, it could be two copies of uh, Yang and Mills looking back at you. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, uh, there's a loop order generalization that's very natural, which is basically the same thing that at the integram level associated with every graph. You can associate, um, you can you can assign it to cubic graphs, and you can find kinematic representations that satisfy the same algebraic properties as your color representations. And if you can find such representations, then um, then you can immediately again start playing with them like they're Legos. Um, <clears throat> or to go for a different metaphor, um, scattering amplitudes of many relativistic Theories admit a double copy of numerator algebra, and this 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 ends up weaving a web between what would be apparently very disparate theories. Um, and I should point out that the, this has structure that has yet to be generally understood the level of the action. So for very simple cases like self dual Yang Mills, and actually recently for the nonlinear sigma model. We've got actions that make this manifest. We've got the right gauge choices and auxiliary fields that make this manifest at the level of the action. Um, but, uh, but, but we don't have this everywhere yet. Um, and just to give uh, some, uh, some cartoon examples, we've already talked a little bit. The Chiral Lagrangian satisfies color kinematics. I've put up a plot of, uh, of, of uh, some predictions from alpha attractor models um, and and so these these, these are, are fun and popular compact uh, inflationary models. And the reason they're so fun and compact is because they rely on millipotent superfields, and millipotent superfields are one to one with Volkov and Kulov, which we have a double copy understanding of. QCD with massive fundamental fermions of these color kinematics. We can get into a color kinematics form form. 
and uh, spectacularly uh, even open strings as well as closed strings uh, can be expressed as uh, double copies, as field theory double copies. So I've, I've put all these names and different uh, things here, but I just, the, the reason I put this slide up is because it lets me get a lot of names up. The point I want you to take is that all of these theories can be built out of combining very small different ingredients. The predictions of these theories can be combined with built out of just a small number of different ingredients combined in different ways and added <coughs> Um, so, I don't have a tremendous amount of time. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take you through just a, a little bit of geometry associated with, um, with the structures we're finding, and, and then I'm going to close. Uh, the, the geometry is easiest to see when you can put all the graphs together on the same page. So for example, this is, these are the cubic graphs contributed to four-point tree. And so if I want to talk about the entire, um, the entire amplitude at the same time, then I'll talk about a graph of graphs, uh, where all of my vertices are the graphs that contribute to the predictions. And the edges are whitehead or Jacobi moves that let you move from one graph to the other. So it's just operating on an edge, reconfiguring how, um, how the uh, external edges need to build new propagators, but this allows you to just walk through all the graphs that contribute to prediction. There are only three at four point, uh, and you'll notice forms a nice triangle, and uh, at any time this triangle shows up, it's occasion for a Jacobi to be satisfied or, or violated if you don't have an angelic representation. Um, <coughs> So, uh, theory-specific input, we don't have to talk about full amplitudes to have gauge invariant predictions relative to the theory. We can talk about color script or partial amplitudes. Um, the graphs that contribute to partial amplitudes uh, are graphs by taking something that obeys the color order of a color script amplitude and then just operating a T hat to closure that maintains color order. And it turns out this forms a one skeleton of a polytube called a sociohedra. Um, <clears throat> Because of, uh, if you wanted to touch every vertex once, you'd need n minus two factorial of these guys, uh, and this would correspond to a well-known basis for scattering amplitudes in terms of partial amplitudes proven sufficient by Del, Dix and Del Duca, Dixon, and Moltoni. Um, but it turns out this is uh, this is overkill because of Jacobi. Notice uh, there are triangles on the outside here. Right, and so if I know all the outside guys, then triangles push this information where it's, if things satisfy Jacobi, so if I know this guy and this guy, I know this guy. So if I know all the outer guys, then I know this next ring, and then these guys are just satisfied by triangles and that. So all the information I actually need is this boundary data. Um, so it turns out I only need uh, M minus three factorial uh, amplitudes uh, of these partial amplitudes of the sociohedra to specify all this data. So five point, I actually only need two pentagons to talk about all the data. Um, so at any multiplicity to get the, the masters as boundary data, uh, you just need to operate with U hat tilt closure. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this, this also, so this forms one skeleton of a polytype called a permeohedra. Um, so, uh, so you can, of course, so I'll, I'll be wrapping up in one minute. So you can solve for um, this boundary data, you can always solve for in terms of invariant predictions associated with the theory to make sure you're talking about the theory you mean to be talking about. Um, but there's leftover gauge freedom that seems to be intimately tied to be able to satisfy this at loop level. Um, it turns out that uh, what I'm showing you is something that grows factorially, right? This isn't beating down the factorial, um, but it turns out that if you allow Jacobi and automorphic symmetry, then, uh, then you reduce everybody to a half ladder at all multiplicity. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, let me just skip a couple slides. Um, just to just to highlight the difference is the difference between something like this that you're expressing directly in terms of generic partial amplitudes and something like this, which is automorphic symmetric. Uh, is the difference between only needing one bit of information to all multiplicity, one graph how the half ladder is dressed, versus needing a factorial amount of information to all multiplicity. <coughs> um, to drive that point home, the building blocks at six point, these order C, the sociohedra look like, this is a color ordered amplitude, it's a set of masters, is a permutahedra, all 105 graphs at six point are encoded in the sociohedra that's fixed by six of these guys. Um, and uh, with those pretty pictures on the screen, I am going to forgo the next slides I would have shown you. But feel free to come speak to me. Uh, there's lots to do in this. Um, there are many, many different theories. At the quantum level, we can talk about this. And we're having a lot of fun looking at how we can start applying this to interesting classical calculations as well. So uh, more than happy to speak with any of you. Thanks. Are you actually reinventing the bootstrap in the sense of using symmetry and consistency <laughs> rather than the action? Well, so I think reinventing would be a strong word. I think we're certainly inspired in, in pursuing a bootstrap, if you like. Well, um, I, it gets a bit more specific. I mean, I, I saw the well-known Pentagon equation, and now it's called the associahedron. Now it's called the associate. Well, so, okay, so so um, you're saying that. Well, I'm, I'm not actually sure. Do you, want, do you want to say that again? Well, I saw an equation known as the Pentagon equation in the bootstrap. And uh -huh. It was called the associahedron in your talk. Ah, okay. So 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 um, there is a polytope that is. This is a classic polytope that's existed for decades. <coughs> called the Sociohedra. Uh, I think we're not making any uh, priority claims on recognizing the color order and amplitudes are related by uh, whitehead moves, but... Um, are, are you saying that, that we would benefit more from speaking with, with uh, classical bootstrap people? If so, I absolutely agree. Okay, that's, I think, awesome. Um, uh, sorry, we don't have really time because we have Pascal, we're a little bit late. Thank you very much. Let's thank you again, John Dodd.